Okay, so I graded the exams. I've given you all back your exams. Um, the top score was 101 point something out of 100. But the bottom score was a little lower. And so the average was 66. I graded out of 90, which raises the average to somewhere close to 80%. Um, so yeah, just, just be aware of your raw score divided by 90 is your percentage score. And I want to go over the test. So I'm scrapping the lecture, which means there won't be as homework assignment due on Monday. And we're going to just talk about the test. And so here I've written on the test form what the percentages for the class were on each problem. Um, only one person missed problem number one. But there were some people who were confounded a little bit by the pound. The pound is a unit of force. One person who just smiled at me when I said that wrote that you can convert a pound to kilograms. You cannot convert a pound to kilograms. Pounds are force. I push on this wall with a force of 20 pounds. I'm not pushing on it with any mass in kilograms. They're different things. So a pound is a force. It's the SI unit. What is the SI equivalent? to the kilogram, that is the SI unit for mass? Or excuse me, it, it is kilogram. I, I, the imperial unit for mass. Remember that? Slugs. Go slugs, in case you're a fan of the UCSC sports teams. University of California, Santa Cruz. All right. Um, this number three was actually a direct question from the worksheet. If you have a constant velocity on the worksheet, it says 60 miles per hour instead of 30 meters per second. But if it's constant velocity, then that means the acceleration is zero, which by Newton's second law means that the net force must be zero. <clears throat> Air resistance is probably doing work on the car unless you're in a vacuum. And so the engine is also working to push on the ground to counter that. No force is acting on the car. Well, there are no forces acting on the car, no normal force, no gravity. It doesn't make sense, right? Not on our earth. Um, not when it says driving down a road. The driver's asleep. No, do not answer this one. Just, you know, the net force in the car is constant, but not zero. If the net force was constant and not zero, what would happen to the car? It'd be accelerating, which could mean speeding up or it could mean turning. Which would be the most likely scenario if the driver was asleep, actually. Now to the first one that had a subpar score. Which statement is true about the force of friction between a car's tires and an asphalt road? And this was simply getting at, you know, you read through all of these and, you know, there's some difference in principle there. But the one that was important was the one that was correct which is the force of static friction is always greater than or equal to the force of kinetic friction. Now I stated this in the reverse. The force of the kinetic friction is, um, actually my thing got the wrong, you know, that's right. The force of kinetic friction is less than or equal to the maximum force of the static friction. Right, so instead of stating it with static friction first like I always did in class, I just reversed the order to make sure people understood the concept. And apparently that one did not strike a chord with you. But the key is it's always going to require greater or equal force to break something into sliding than it does to keep it sliding. Okay, then we had a little problem with breaking over a tree, Newton's third law. You hit the tree, it breaks. You still hit it as hard as it hit you. But then we got to a brutal one, 54%. A tether ball is going around the support pole, not touching the pole, in a horizontal circle. So remember a class I talked about it before the test. Here's your tether ball pole. Here's your rope. Yeah. Here's the tether ball going around the horizontal circle. So it's going like this. And if you put the forces on there, Let's start with, well, let's just go through each one of these and say why it's correct or why it's incorrect. Centrifugal, correct or incorrect? Is, is centrifugal force acting on that ball? No. Why not? It's not a real force. Not real force is 
can't act on things. Centripetal force. <laughs> Apparently not. This was one of the ones that was commonly answered that's not correct. Centripetal force is a resultant. It's what you get for the sum of the forces toward the center of a circle. So it's not a force you draw in your free body diagram. It's what you get when you add all of those forces up. Gravity. Bueno. Force of gravity right there. Normal. Why not normal? That was another one a lot of people missed. Because it's not against the surface. It's not against the surface, right. So not normal. Tension. Absolutely. What direction is the tension going to pull it? Yeah. Parallel to the cord going away. It's always the rule. Okay? No problem with that one or that one or that one. A little bit of problem with potential energy is only associated with conservative forces. Did I remember to? Well, I've got the answer key on here too. The most skipped problem, number 11. <laughs> Scoff law is somebody who doesn't pay attention to the law. You know you can't hang anything from your rear view mirror, right? That's against the law. Okay. No, you can't. Then why does it put it on the bank? Because we're all scoff laws. Hmm? You, you, it's legal to put something in a lower left-hand corner and lower right-hand corner. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, I imagine that it would never be a problem if you can't see it, you know, if it's not blocked. The, the point is blocking your point of view. Okay, so not a big deal about the scoff law. He's accelerating, and you see that tassel is hanging like this at an angle of 22 degrees from vertical. And the question is, what's the acceleration? Very small amount of information given, right? I imagine that's why a lot of people skip it, because it's not much information. If you're asked about force, or not about force, but about acceleration, at this point, you know this isn't a kinematic equation problem, so it's got to be a Newton's second law problem. And what do you do every time it's a Newton's second law problem? You draw a free body diagram. So I'm going to take the tassel as if it's just a point mass. And what forces are acting on this point mass? Gravity and tension, right? It's the same picture. So I have force of gravity, force of tension. Newton's second law, sum of the force vectors is equal to ma vector, right? So this has two forces and a resultant. Makes a nice triangle. I'm not going to break into components. I'm just going to make a triangle. So adding these up, I have... Force tension, force gravity equals mg, and then how do I find the resultant when I add two vectors? Uh, <laughs> from, okay, from the starting point to the ending point. So there is my ma vector. The angle that I know is this angle right here. It's the same in both pictures, so there's no hard work in figuring that out. And so I have a right triangle, and I'm looking for something with the opposite side, and mg, I've got that from the adjacent side. So I just have tangent theta is opposite over adjacent, ma over mg. The m's cancel, so it doesn't matter what the mass of that tassel was. And if you solve for A, A equals G tangent theta. Wow. So it was a very short, straightforward application of Newton's second law. But it, I, I can see why you would think, ah, I don't have enough information to do anything here. Yeah, it's got like three senses, but two of them didn't have anything to do with the problem except for just saying cars accelerate. I didn't count the sentences. Is it really three? Yeah, it's three. <laughs> Okay, so the next one, 50%. A car starts from rest and accelerates to a speed of 
36.6 meters per second over a horizontal distance of 105 meters. How much work was done? What's our concept? Remember, always planning your attack. Start with what's the concept? Uh, and so so no, no, it's not Newton's second law. It is. Really there, there are ways to get there with Newton's second law, but the easier approach is work energy. Right, so I'm not going to say it's wrong saying Newton's second law. It's just going to be a lot more work to get the answer. But work energy says that the net work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared, so that's one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. Well, what was v initial? And that came out to be 827 kilojoules. Maxwell. You, you could do that too. There, there, that's, that's basically, you know, using a kinematic equation is what Randy said. You got Newton's second law to find acceleration, blah, blah, blah. Right. It's, it's another way that works. But I think you could all agree that's probably the shortest way. And as I've been trying to emphasize in physics, as easy as it's not, we still are trying to do things in the easiest way possible. Ah, look, we did well on this one. Centripetal acceleration seemed to, to be good. Not so much with the dragster takes off the peak acceleration of 55 meters per second squared. Yes, that's the peak acceleration for a dragster. That's pretty much booking, right? I looked up a whole bunch of information on dragsters in preparation for this. I learned trivial facts like the supercharger on a top fuel dragster uses up 900 horsepower. That's like four times the horsepower my car puts out. <laughs> just to run its supercharger, which blows in fuel at three atmospheres of pressure. Um, That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So how do we do this? Well, we have the dragster. My dragster is a very simple rail. And I'm dealing with acceleration and friction friction is a force acceleration and force what's my principle forces new second law new second law so if it's new second law i need to draw the forces acting on this so i have force of gravity equals mg down force normal up force of friction pushing it forward uh isn't force of acceleration pushing it forward or force of friction pushing it back no nope. Oh, that's right. Because the the is engine is trying to make the tires turn, but instead of spinning, friction is pushing forward. That's what makes it. Move. So I've got my free body diagram. I'll break things up into component directions. Some of the forces in the y direction is equal to m a y. What's the acceleration in the vertical direction? I know it said taking off, and at least one student thought that meant that it's going upward. It's zero, it's staying on the ground. And I did clarify that with the student. And so if I look at my picture, that tells me force normal minus force of gravity equals zero, which gives me force normal equals force of gravity equals mg. And then if I go to the x direction, so the force of the x direction is equal to max. I'm looking for ax, looking at my picture, that's gonna be force of friction which would be mu force normal. So therefore, AX is equal to mu for force normal. I put MG divided by M. The M's cancel. It's mu times G. Oh, wait. I solved for the wrong thing. I solved for AX instead of for mu. Solve for mu. You divide everything by MG. So I have mu um, equals... M A X over 
mg. The m's cancel. Ax over g, 55 over 9.8, which is slightly bigger than 5.5. So 5.6. Okay, we did reasonably well here on the inelastic collision. And then we had our first disaster. In fact, our biggest disaster, I believe, by far. A 15 kilogram box has a pull rope on it. The pull rope is at an angle of 30 degrees above horizontal. If a tension of 100 newtons is required to pull the box at constant speed across the horizontal floor, what's the coefficient of friction? So, what is our principle? Newton's second law. So if it's Newton's second law, what do I have to do? Free body diagram. So I have my box. Yeah, I don't want to use red. My box. What forces are acting on the box? Uh, gravity. Force gravity? Force normal. And there's force tension and force static. What direction is the force tension? Uh, horizontal at a 30 degree angle above the horizontal. And now you said static friction, but it's sliding. Oh, so then it's connected. And what direction is the force connect friction? Uh, backwards. Yes. Yeah. And can drive on draw on this side. Yeah, I'll keep I'll keep FN. I change between FN and N. N I usually use for magnitude, FN for the name of the force. Ah, well, that's good enough. What should I do next? Break into components, right? These, these are rules we use every time. X, Y, I better define what X and Y are, or they make no sense to use them. And so I have force of gravity is zero in the X direction and minus MG in the Y direction. Force normal is zero in the X direction and N in the Y direction. And force of tension is equal to tension cosine theta in the x direction, tension sine theta in the y direction, and finally, force friction is minus mu n and zero. So what should I do next? So the force is in the y direction is MAY. What is MAY? What is the acceleration in the y direction? It's moving at a constant speed across a horizontal floor. So what's its zero. acceleration in the vertical direction? Zero. What's the acceleration in the horizontal direction for that matter? Constant speed? Zero. zero. So I have tension sine theta plus normal minus mg equals zero. So tension is equal to, or not tension, n is equal to mg minus tension sine theta. Right, the tension was partially upward, so it is taking some of the force of gravity, force normal is decreased, and then I go to some of the forces in the x direction equals max equals zero is equal to tension cosine theta minus mu n. So I'm looking for mu, right? Yes. So solving this for mu, mu is equal to tension cosine theta over n, substitute the n I found before, and then you just have to put in numbers. All over m, 15 kilograms. And so when all is said and done, you end up with, yeah. it's which number? E, yeah. That's a letter, by the way, I said number. 0 0.893 for your coefficient of friction. So that one was probably the longest one as well of the application problems. Then we get to the synthesis. Now, if you look, none of the synthesis problems were as bad as the one we just did. So the one we just did was the one people had the hardest time with. 
but all of these were were a little low. And as I believe David can attest to, I told him Tuesday morning, I was worried that my synthesis problems were a little challenging. I was probably going to have to scale the test. Right. So I, I recognize that these were a little more challenging. And that's, you know, that's why your grades are higher than the raw scores, because I want to accurately reflect what you know, not frustrate you. So number one, or number 17, a ball is attached to a cord of length L and is twirled in a horizontal circle at a constant speed such that the string makes a constant angle of theta equals 9.85 degrees from horizontal. What's the speed of the ball? It has one more number than the tassel problem, but once again, it seems light on numbers, right? But clearly it's doable or I wouldn't have given it to you. First step. What's the first step to solving the problem? Actually, before I even draw the figure, I concept, identify the concept. So if it's going in a circle, at this point, that's a centripetal force to me right off the bat. And so if I'm dealing with centripetal force, I'm probably also dealing with Newton's second law. Probably, not a given. So I know my concept has to have centripetal acceleration and probably Newton's second law. So then I draw my diagram and oddly there were at least two people who had when you swing this around the circle, it's swinging at a constant circle above your hand instead of below your hand. It needs to be below your hand because you need the tension to provide an upward force to counter gravity. If it was above your hand, both tension and gravity would be pulling down and it would come down. So there are a couple of people who lost the point there because they had it up above horizontal instead of down below. So just like what we had with the tether ball, it's going like that. A lot of people correctly identified the radius is the radius of the circle. It's not the length of the string. And so you have, this is radius, this is length, and here's that angle theta. And so radius is equal to L cosine theta. So that was one important step is getting the radius right because for equations, we have a centripetal is V squared over R. We need to know the R if we're going to do that right. Now, second thing is draw those forces. I hope it's something. Now, force of gravity equals MG, force of tension and break things into components. What direction should I choose for my components? Uh, angle it along the tension. Okay, not going to angle it along the tension because my rule number one is if there's acceleration, I want one direction parallel to it. So in my direction, my position here, what direction is it accelerating? Horizontally, Horizontally toward the center. So I'm choosing my coordinate system. Y in center. So break them into components. Center Y, force of gravity is zero toward the center and minus MG in the Y. Force tension is tension cosine actually. It's the same as the L there. Cosine theta in the center direction and tension sine theta in the Y direction. And then I have some of the force. Actually, I just realized I could have done this the short way as well, like I did with the um, tether ball question, or the, excuse me, like I did with the tassel question. I didn't have to break into components. I could have immediately said that, uh, that the acceleration was G tangent theta. But hey, I'm halfway through this, so let's keep going. Some of the force of the y direction is equal to MAY 
equals zero. So I have T sine theta minus mg equals zero. Some of the forces in the X direction equals MAX, or uh, that's not X, that's C. So that's gonna be T cosine theta equals MAC. Solve this one for T. Substitute over here. And you see we can cancel the M, so the mass doesn't matter. And so V is the square root of R over tangent theta. Actually comes out to be really simpler than I thought. Did I, I missed a G, I missed a G. Yeah, I was like, I'm missing something here. G, Go, what? Remember, always check your units. <laughs> Square root of 0.80 meters per second squared times, and my radius was L cosine theta. So I got to put in my 0 0.825 meters cosine theta. And you put all that in the calculator and out pops an answer that's 6.77 if I remember right. Oh, next to worst problem on the test. Well, actually, yeah, beat, beat out the worst extra credit. Next to worst problem on the test. A 5,000 kilogram roller coaster starts from rest at an elevation of 105 meters it goes up and down and all around until near the end, it does a perfectly circular loop with the radius of 14.5 meters. At the top of the loop is an elevation of 32.5 meters. This one's got lots of numbers in it. For safety reasons, you decide that the top of the, at the top of the loop, the upside down riders must have a downward normal force that is equal to half of their normal body weight. What's the equation for their normal body weight? Force of gravity is mg, and so half mg is what the force normal is going to be. And what's the maximum amount of work that can be done by friction and air resistance during the ride to maintain this safety margin? What's our concept? Uh, We, like we definitely want to use work energy, but we also have centripetal acceleration, which means we're probably going to have Newton's second law. So we're putting it together, the picture. There were a number of people who surprised me by having a picture with the ending height higher than the starting height. Okay, that's a perfect circle. I have to redraw it because that is not very perfect. Okay. It's mo better. You are right. Y initial is 105 meters. Y final is equal to 32.5 meters. And I have my cart here with V initial is zero. My cart here, V final is unknown. And then, because I have Newton's second law, what else do I need to do? Uh, you also need to break this circle. Oh, okay, I'll draw on the race of the circle. That's good. R. 
equals 14.25 or 14.5, isn't it? 14.5. Yeah. Meters? And draw my forces. So at the top of the loop, what forces are acting on a person sitting in that cart? Gravity, Gravity which points down. What else? Force normal, pointing down, equals two, and we were given one half mg. Yeah, I don't draw that on the figure, right. on the diagram. If we're doing work energy, I need to identify kinetic energy initial, one half mv initial squared, which is zero. Potential energy initial is equal to mg y initial. Kinetic energy final, one half m v final squared. Potential energy final equals m g y final. I've got everything set up in my diagram now. Now we just have to figure out what order to do the work. Well, we were given the normal force. We already know the force of gravity, so it looks like that's a pretty complete deal. So that's where I'm going to start. So this one here was... I mean, you could have started other places, but I'm starting there just because I know the most about it. Yes. Okay. This is exactly analogous. The tension will be acting like normal force. So normally if I'm sitting in the, in the car, just stationary at the ground, normal force is pushing up, right? Here, tension is pulling up. As it goes around, the tension is pulling it to keep it going in a circle, just like normal force is pushing the cart to keep it in a circle. And so as I go around, now if I go slow, my tension goes to zero out there, right? But if I go fast, I need more tension to keep it going in a circle. So there is tension pulling down even when it's at the top. If there wasn't tension, what would happen? It goes flying up in the direction which is traveling at the moment. I release it. So I need the tension to keep it going in a circle because it's going too fast for gravity to affect the circle. And so that's why you could, you know, design a roller coaster where you don't technically need a seat belt because the normal force is still going to be pushing you down and holding you in place. Well, your inertia holds you in place. So starting with Newton's second law, Sum of the forces toward the center is equal to mass times acceleration toward the center. Adding those up, that's going to be force of gravity and force normal both toward the center. Substituting for what centripetal acceleration is and what force gravity and force normal are, mg plus one half mg equals mv squared over r. Well, if you look at the kinetic energy, it's in terms of v squared and this was the v final so i'm just going to solve this for v final square i'm not even going to square root it so cancel the m's everywhere notice g plus one half g is three halves g multiplying by r v final squared is equal to three halves rg so that's my final speed squared now i go to my work energy relation Work non-conservative, that's what I'm trying to find is the work non-conservative is equal to the change in kinetic energy minus the, plus the change in potential energy. So that's one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared, that term is zero, plus m g y final minus m g y initial. I now have all of the values because I solve for V final squared. So it's equal to one half M times three halves G R plus M G Y final minus Y initial. I just combined those. Notice I have M G in all the terms actually. And now I just put in my numbers. Or 
one half times three halves is three quarters. And this comes out to be 301 megajoules minus because it's lost. And so that's where I said, oopsie, I just use one significant digit and it'll be the right number. I don't know what happened. I changed the height, the ending height, and I might've put in the number from the first ending height before I, I had the ending height was lower than 29 which is possible, but then your circle, the bottom part of the circle is below zero and I just change it to being above. Any questions about that? I'm not getting any excited. I feel good about it, but I'm also not getting any questions. I don't feel like I have like questions that would actually Okay. How did you get the acceleration? Okay, how did I get the acceleration? Because it's going in a circle, I know the acceleration has to have. And so I found it by using Newton's second law in the central direction and knowing what the central acceleration has to be. I, that, I use that to find the final square. All righty, we are definitely past the worst of it. 59% or 57% for both of these. What's the difference in this one and the previous collision problem that people did well on? Inelastic versus elastic. The inelastic case was in the application because it was very straightforward. They just end up at the same speed. This one here, which is what I did in class on Monday, is where they end up at different speeds and so you have to start with hey this is an elastic collision elastic collisions mean that kinetic energy is conserved and the problem specifies that it's no friction so that means that the external force is acting on my system are zero and momentum is conserved so my concepts here are elastic collision collision only has there we go. That's shorthand for saying momentum is conserved and kinetic energy is conserved. No change in either of those. So I have my picture. Your picture should show the two coming toward each other and then bouncing off of each other. And the speeds. I'm, I'm suddenly worried about time. I don't know. I actually have 10 minutes here. So one, two, V one initial, V one final, oh, V two initial, V one final, V two final. So I put it like this in my picture. Now the fact is, one is going to end up going like this. But you wouldn't know that beforehand, so you could draw it either way. Obviously, I'm not going to mark you wrong for how you choose to draw the arrow there because you don't know until you do the calculation. So once I have those written out, I have two equations. Two. Why two? Because I have two unknowns. I have my knowns are... M1, M2, V1 initial, and V1, or V2 initial. My unknowns are V1 final and V2 final. I only ask you to find one of those, but I don't know either of them. And so I need two equations, one conservation momentum, M1, V1 initial, plus M2, V2 initial is equal to M1, V1 final, plus M2, V2 final. The second equation, kinetic energy is conserved. 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. I should have said initials on both of those. It's equal to 1 half m1 v1 final squared plus 1 half m2 v2 final squared. Now remember I told you if you remembered it, I would let you just take 
If you combine those two, it gives you the equation V1 initial plus V1 final is equal to V2 initial plus V2 final. It just it saves about three lines in the work. So I am going to take those relations and combine them. I'm looking for V1 final. What is the final velocity of cart one? So I'm going to solve the lower equation. Why the lower? Because it's the simpler. For V2 final and substitute it into the upper equation to eliminate V2 final. So So there I've made the substitution. Now I have an equation with only V1 final is unknown. And so I will distribute that last term, collect my V1 finals and solve for it. So there's, I distributed these last three terms came from there. And then V1 final, I have two terms with V1 final here and here. So those add together to give me M1 plus M2 all times V1 final. I will move the remaining terms over to that side of the equation. And so I'm going to have V1 initial times M1 minus M2 minus because bringing the M2 V10 over, you have to subtract. Um, plus 2M2 V2 initial. This was negative, so you had to add it to bring it over. And yeah, that should be it. So last of all, divide by M1 plus M2. And so now we just put in the value. So V1 initial was V, M1 was 4M, M2 was M. Plus 2, M2 is M, and V2 initial is minus V. Divided by 4M plus M. So four minus one is three and three minus two is one. And so on top, I have MV. On bottom, four plus one is five. So on bottom, I have five M. So this is one fifth V. All right. Who wants to do some calculus? Okay, so your equation is force is equal to minus gradient of potential energy. So you get the direction from the gradient vector, <clears throat> David. You get the minus sign, Randy, from that definition. And then it's just doing the derivatives. So you all did the derivatives, right? It was just stupid signage. <laughs> okay. Extra credit. Woohoo, the MCAT type questions. Now, I, I sometimes wonder about the quality of the MCAT preparation people get. Because when I look at these questions, it seems like one in four of them are incorrect. Like 
the, an example that I almost used was something being launched by a spring that says, what's the acceleration? And the acceleration is constantly changing. And so you really can't answer that question. Um, but I made sure I chose ones here that are correct. If you ever have questions about, you know, preparing for the MCAT and the physics, I am here as a resource. What is the acceleration of the system shown to the right? This is exactly what we did in the lab, right? We have the mass hanging that's accelerating. The pulley is just changing the direction. And so in my calculation, I just redraw this as if the mass was moved up to there with the force of gravity hanging going that direction. And then I apply Newton's second law. Some of the forces in the only direction now, since I straightened it out, is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass is the mass of my entire system. So that's going to be 65 plus 14 is the total mass of the system. I'll put an M sub S here just so we're clear on that. And when I look at the sum of the forces, since there's no friction, the assume table is frictionless, and that the rope connecting blocks is mass negligible. So I have 14 kilograms times G is the mass that's pulling it is equal to 14 kilograms plus 65 kilograms acceleration. So just divide both sides by 14 to 65 is 79. And I get the acceleration is 14 over 79 G. And so when you put that in the calculator, 14 over 79 is obviously a small number times G is 1.7. Yes, Judith. Uh, what's the subscript S in the equation stand system? That, that was for system. Okay. Everything that I'm considering, right? When you're using that Newton's second law, you have to identify this is the object I'm applying it to. And in this case, my object is the system of the mass on top and the mass hanging and the string in between. But it's set to assume the mass of string is zero. All righty. Next to final one. Um, people got 50% on this, and the last one we'll skip because people did well on that. The stopping distance is the distance a vehicle will travel from the point when the brakes are fully applied to when it comes to a complete stop. A race car with this mass, you know what, that mass is absolutely unimportant to the problem. With the driver is traveling along a racetrack at a velocity of this speed, once again, also completely irrelevant. The coefficient of friction between wet asphalt and rubber is 0.2 between... Dry asphalt rubber is 0.9. And then it asks us these questions. Both vehicles use static friction to come to complete stop. I honestly don't know. It doesn't tell me that. It just says the coefficient of friction. It doesn't say static or kinetic. The calculated stopping distance is 4.5 times greater for a racer on wet asphalt. That is absolutely true because the force of static friction is two-ninths the size. But the work has to be the same. And work is force times distance. So if the force is two ninths the size, then the distance has to be nine halves so that they add up to the same, or multiply out, excuse me, to the same value. So the correct answer was work one equals work two, or dry, wet, mu dry, force normal, distance dry equals mu wet force normal, distance wet, divide, see what do we want? We want a distance wet. So I'm going to divide everything by mu wet force normal. And I get distance wet is equal to distance dry times mu dry over mu wet. Uh, no, 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 it's yours to keep. I've already got them photocopied. And the complete solutions are available here on, on OneNote as well as on Moodle. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great vacation. I will see you on Monday. So we have no work here for Monday?